This is flipped mini lecture number 17. And we're going to cover 8.1, 8.2, and 8.3 of night. And in 8.1, basically night brings projectile motion back to you, but in a slightly different language. Before, we just said there was an acceleration, and the acceleration was in the y direction, and it had value minus g. And that was that. But now you know Newton's second law. And it must be that this acceleration in the y direction is caused by a force. And that force is indeed minus m times g, where m is the mass of the object that is being acted on. And so then what we have that f sub y is equal to minus mg, but f sub y is also equal to m a sub y, so a sub y must be minus g. We're just saying the same thing, except now we have sort of a y for it. Why does everything accelerate downward with acceleration in the y direction minus g? Because it's being pulled downward with a force in the y direction of value minus mg. Now there's a slightly fancier way of writing that, and I want to make sure that you guys remember that. I introduced it quite a while back. We have a vector i hat, which is a unit vector pointing in the plus x direction. We have a vector j hat, which is a unit vector pointing in the plus y direction. If we have a unit vector pointing in the plus y direction, we can now write f sub g like this. Instead of writing the y component of f sub g is minus mg, we can write that f sub g is minus mg times j hat. In other words, it points in the opposite direction of this unit vector, j hat, which is a unit vector pointing up, and it has magnitude of mg. Just more ways of writing things, but at least it's one more thing in your toolbox and allows you to kind of write the force of gravity vectorially instead of always immediately resorting to components. That pretty well covers 8.1. In uh, both the early and the later section, I did the example of a rocket ship that was started off from the launch pad with an angle theta from the launch pad and maintained that angle theta as it shot out over the Atlantic, and we discovered that it goes in a straight line. And then in both classes, I said, if you put drag into this problem, it gets pretty hard. And I promised to send a PDF. Well, I'm going to insert uh, the PDF right here into the video. It did get pretty hard, and I don't really think there's that much to learn from this particular formula, and you can skip right over that unless you're really interested in what happens to a rocket when there's also this complicated drag force that's proportional to the velocity squared. Now we'll go on to 8.2. And 8.2 is a fancier way of thinking about uniform circular motion. So in uniform circular motion, you know that we have a force that points towards the center that is keeping the thing going in a circle with angular frequency omega. We know that this acceleration, because I proved it a few lectures back, we know that this acceleration's magnitude is r omega squared where omega is the angular frequency, omega is also 2 pi over t, omega is also 2 pi times the ordinary frequency. Um, we know that it's r omega squared, and it always points inward. Now, it's not very satisfying to write a vector like that, so I am going to introduce, really, an insane new coordinate system. An insanely great new coordinate system. I'm going to introduce a coordinate system that wherever you are, let's say I'm over here. Let's say I'm not even on this circle. Let's say I'm over here. Wherever you are, there's going to be a unit vector that points outward. Fair enough. 
That means that if I'm over here, I've got a unit vector that points that way. And if I'm over here, that means I've got a unit vector that points that way. And wherever I'm at, I will call that unit vector r hat. It's a unit vector that points outward, but by points outward, you have to first say, well, where in this problem am I talking about? Now, as soon as you've introduced a unit vector that points outward, if you're in a two-dimensional problem, you start going, well, gosh, if I had an arbitrary vector here, like I had a vector that pointed off that direction, I could resolve that vector into a part that points outward, and a part that's perpendicular to that. And so we want to capture that. So wherever you are, we introduce another vector that points in the plus theta direction. Usually when we're in math class, we talk about theta as being the angle from the horizontal axis to the right. It doesn't really matter where you start or measure theta from. We just, just for the moment here, imagine that the direction of increasing theta is going around counterclockwise. If that's the direction of increasing theta, that tells us of the two directions that are perpendicular to r here, that tells us one to pick. And we're going to pick the one that's going in the direction of increasing theta and is perpendicular to r hat. And that vector we're going to call theta hat. So over here, there's r hat. There's the direction of increasing theta. We're going to call that theta hat. And over here, there's the direction of increasing theta. We're going to call that theta hat. So now, in this new wacky coordinate system where the actual direction of r hat and theta hat vary depending on where you're at, we have a new way of writing the centripetal acceleration. Instead of saying, oh, it's r omega squared inward, we say it's minus r omega squared times r hat. Because r hat's a vector that points outward wherever you're at. Minus it turns it around so it points inward. And r omega squared has the, the coefficient of r hat is the right coefficient to give this thing the right overall size. A, the acceleration, is minus r omega squared times r hat. Now, we know from f equals ma that this must be caused by a force. So that's the centripetal acceleration. Whatever's keeping this thing going in a circle is what we call the centripetal force. And we can already see here how much the centripetal force must be. It's just m times the centripetal acceleration. So we know that's minus m r omega squared times r hat. This can be done for example, if you're swinging around something on a cord, then this thing here would be keeping it going in a circle thanks to the tension in a cord. If you're hanging on to a carousel and going around the carousel, it's your hands pulling outward on the carousel and the carousel pulling back inward on you is what's keeping you going around the carousel. Whatever. There's always different things that might be keeping you going in circular motion. Perhaps gravity is keeping you going in circular motion. Let's take a look at that situation. And I have a satellite that's going low around the surface of the Earth. Why low? Like maybe why only 100 or 200 miles up? Because I don't want to worry yet about the fact that gravity gets weaker as you go higher. So wherever gravity is at here, I'm going to assume that it's about the same as the gravity right at the surface of the Earth. And so we know in this new fancy wacky coordinate system, we know that the force of gravity is equal to minus mg times r hat because it points inwards towards the center of the Earth, and it has magnitude, which is equal to the mass of the satellite that's going around this thing, times g, the acceleration of gravity at the surface of the Earth. So f sub g is minus mg r hat. Oh, 
Okay, now let's set that equal to what we know as the acceleration because it's always true that F equals MA and the only force that's keeping this thing going in a circle going around the Earth is the gravitational force. So let's set, we know that the left hand side of this equation, F, is that. The right hand side of this equation is minus m r omega squared times r hat. Okay, so if this is the ma and this is f, then we can set these two equal to each other. ma is that, f is that, we therefore have minus mg r hat is equal to minus mr omega squared r hat. Now it's really fortunate that there's r hats on both sides of this equation because otherwise that would say that we don't really have a solution. So something multiplying r hat is equal to something else multiplying r hat. That means that this must be equal to that. And we have minus signs on both sides of this equation so we can get rid of those. We also have m's on both sides of these equations so we can get rid of those. And now we have our answer that the frequency omega, if you're, going, if you're a satellite going around the Earth, you just solve this equation for omega, and you have omega equals to the square root of g over r. Now if you look at Knight, equation 8.12, he has something pretty close to that. He has v orbit equals square root of r times g. So the velocity of an object in orbit is the square root of r times g. And you look at my equation, I have omega equals square root of g over r. Can we reconcile those two? Yes. Multiply both sides of my equation by r. Ba -boom, ba -boom. Bring that r inside the square root where it becomes an r squared r squared over r becomes r, so what's inside the square root now is just rg. Well, that's starting to look like Knight's right-hand side in equation 8.12. Are we totally there? Let's look at the left-hand side. Oh, the radius times the angular frequency, yeah, that's the orbital velocity. So I have got, just like Knight, v orbit equals square root of rg. Okay, the last thing that I wanted to tell you about, and which I want you to read about, is this business about centrifugal force. This is the beginning of 8.4. There's a big misconception, and the big misconception there is something called centrifugal force. There is no such thing called centrifugal force. Let's imagine that I am going around a corner. Okay, and maybe I'm in a car going around that corner. And if I'm going around that corner really fast, then the right side of my body is going to be pressed against the outside of the car. And a lot of people kind of interpret that as if there is some kind of force pushing me outward, some imaginary centrifugal force, which is pushing me outward, and then Whatever is on the right side of the car, like the car, the, the passenger side window pressing against the right side of my face, whatever is on the outside of my car is pushing back on me and balancing that imaginary centrifugal force. Okay, but there's nothing on the left of you pushing on you. So from a free body diagram standpoint, it makes zero sense at all to talk about an outward centrifugal force. There's nothing pushing me outward against the passenger side window. What's the resolution of this? Well, the resolution of this is the passenger side window is the only thing that's pushing towards the center on me. And there is nothing pushing outwards towards the outside of the circle on me. The passenger side window is pressing against my face and the right side of the bucket seat is pressing against my torso and the right side of maybe my thigh is pressing against the car door, all to keep me accelerating to the left in a circle. So um, the bottom line is centrifugal force is a misnomer. If you want to get a great head start on Wednesday's class, 
Wednesday's workbook stuff and Wednesday night's homework, you could read Gravity on a Rotating Earth and Why Does Water Stay in a Bucket? And you'll be definitely uh, well ahead of the game. Okay.